Chapter 9, Part B of The Wealth of Nations, Book 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Book 4, Chapter 9, Part B of the agricultural systems or of those systems of political economy which represent the produce of land as either the sole or the principal source of the revenue and wealth of every country the capital error of this system however seems to lie in its representing the class of artificers manufacturers and merchants as altogether barren and unproductive the following observations may serve to show the impropriety of this representation first this class it is acknowledged reproduces annually the value of its own annual consumption and continues at least the existence of the stock or capital which maintains and employs it but upon this account alone the denomination of barren or unproductive should seem to be very improperly applied to it we should not call a marriage barren or unproductive though it produced only a son and a daughter to replace the father and mother and though it did not increase the number of the human species but only continued it as it was before farmers and country labourers indeed over and above the stock which maintains and employs them reproduce annually a neat produce a free rent to the landlord as a marriage which affords three children is certainly more productive than one which affords only two so the labour of farmers and country labourers is certainly more productive than that of merchants artificers and manufacturers the superior produce of the one class however does not render the other barren or unproductive secondly it seems on this account altogether improper to consider artificers manufacturers and merchants in the same light as menial servants the labour of menial servants does not continue the existence of the fund which maintains and employs them their maintenance and employment is altogether at the expense of their masters and the work which they perform is not of a nature to repay that expense that work consists in services which perish generally in the very instant of their performance and does not fix or realize itself in any vendable commodity which can replace the value of their wages and maintenance the labour on the contrary of artificers manufacturers and merchants naturally does fix and realize itself in some such vendable commodity it is upon this account that in the chapter in which i treat of productive and unproductive labour i have classed artificers manufacturers and merchants among the productive labourers and menial servants among the barren or unproductive thirdly it seems upon every supposition improper to say that the labour of artificers manufacturers and merchants does not increase the real revenue of the society though we should suppose for example as it seems to be supposed in this system that the value of the daily monthly and yearly consumption of this class was exactly equal to that of its daily monthly and yearly production yet it would not from thence follow that its labour added nothing to the real revenue to the real value of the annual produce of the land and labour of the society an artificer for example who in the first six months after harvest executes ten pounds worth of work though he should in the same time consume ten pounds worth of corn and other necessaries yet really adds the value of ten pounds to the annual produce of the land and labour of the society while he has been consuming a half-yearly revenue of ten pounds worth of corn and other necessaries he has produced an equal value of work capable of purchasing either to himself or to some other person an equal half-yearly revenue the value therefore of what has been consumed and produced during these six months is equal not to ten but to twenty pounds it is possible indeed that no more than ten pounds worth of this value may ever have existed at any one moment of time but if the ten pounds worth of corn and other necessaries which were consumed by the artificer had been consumed by a soldier or by a menial servant the value of that part of the annual produce which existed at the end of the six months would have been ten pounds less than it actually is in consequence of the labour of the artificer though the value of what the artificer produces therefore should not at any one moment of time be supposed greater than the value he consumes yet at every moment of time the actual existing value of goods in the market is in consequence of what he produces greater than it otherwise would be 
when the patrons of this system assert that the consumption of artificers manufacturers and merchants is equal to the value of what they produce they probably mean no more than that their revenue or the fund destined for their consumption is equal to it but if they had expressed themselves more accurately and only asserted that the revenue of this class was equal to the value of what they produced it might readily have occurred to the reader that what would naturally be saved out of this revenue must necessarily increase more or less the real wealth of the society in order therefore to make out something like an argument it was necessary that they should express themselves as they have done and this argument even supposing things actually were as it seems to presume them to be turns out to be a very inconclusive one fourthly farmers and country labourers can no more augment without parsimony the real revenue the annual produce of the land and labour of their society than artificers manufacturers and merchants the annual produce of the land and labour of any society can be augmented only in two ways either first by some improvement in the productive powers of the useful labour actually maintained within it or secondly by some increase in the quantity of that labour the improvement in the productive powers of useful labour depends first upon the improvement in the ability of the workman and secondly upon that of the machinery with which he works but the labour of artificers and manufacturers as it is capable of being more subdivided and the labour of each workman reduced to a greater simplicity of operation than that of farmers and country labourers so it is likewise capable of both these sorts of improvement in a much higher degree in this respect therefore the class of cultivators can have no sort of advantage over that of artificers and manufacturers the increase in the quantity of useful labour actually employed within any society must depend altogether upon the increase of the capital which employs it and the increase of that capital again must be exactly equal to the amount of the savings from the revenue either of the particular persons who manage and direct the employment of that capital or of some other persons who lend it to them if merchants artificers and manufacturers are as this system seems to suppose naturally more inclined to parsimony and saving than proprietors and cultivators they are so far more likely to augment the quantity of useful labour employed within their society and consequently to increase its real revenue the annual produce of its land and labour fifthly and lastly though the revenue of the inhabitants of every country was supposed to consist altogether as this system seems to suppose in the quantity of subsistence which their industry could procure to them yet even upon this supposition the revenue of a trading and manufacturing country must other things being equal always be much greater than that of one without trade or manufactures by means of trade and manufactures a greater quantity of subsistence can be annually imported into a particular country than what its own lands in the actual state of their cultivation could afford the inhabitants of a town though they frequently possess no lands of their own yet draw to themselves by their industry such a quantity of the rude produce of the lands of other people as supplies them not only with the materials of their work but with the fund of their subsistence what a town always is with regard to the country in its neighbourhood one independent state or country may frequently be with regard to other independent states or countries it is thus that holland draws a great part of its subsistence from other countries live cattle from holstein and jutland and corn from almost all the different countries of europe a small quantity of manufactured produce purchases a great quantity of rude produce a trading and manufacturing country therefore naturally purchases with a small part of its manufactured produce a great part of the rude produce of other countries while on the contrary a country without trade and manufactures is generally obliged to purchase at the expense of a great part of its rude produce a very small part of the manufactured produce of other countries the one exports what can subsist and accommodate but a very few and imports the subsistence and accommodation of a great number the other exports the accommodation and subsistence of a great number and imports that of a very few only the inhabitants of the one must always enjoy a much greater quantity of subsistence than what their own lands in the actual state of their cultivation could afford the inhabitants of the other must always enjoy a much smaller quantity 
This system, however, with all its imperfections, is perhaps the nearest approximation to the truth that has yet been published upon the subject of political economy, and is, upon that account, well worth the consideration of every man who wishes to examine with attention the principles of that very important science. Though in representing the labor which is employed upon land as the only productive labor, the notions which it inculcates are, perhaps, too narrow and confined, yet in representing the wealth of nations as consisting not in the unconsumable riches of money but in the consumable goods annually reproduced by the labor of the society and in representing perfect liberty as the only effectual expedient for rendering this annual reproduction the greatest possible its doctrine seems to be in every respect as just as it is generous and liberal its followers are very numerous, and as men are fond of paradoxes, and of appearing to understand what surpasses the comprehensions of ordinary people, the paradox which it maintains, concerning the unproductive nature of manufacturing labor, has not, perhaps, contributed a little to increase the number of its admirers. They have, for some years past, made a pretty considerable sect, distinguished in the French Republic of Letters by the name of the Economists their works have certainly been of some service to their country not only by bringing into general discussion many subjects which had never been well examined before but by influencing in some measure the public administration in favour of agriculture it has been in consequence of their representations accordingly that the agriculture of france has been delivered from several of the oppressions which it before laboured under the term during which such a lease can be granted, as will be valid against every future purchaser or proprietor of the land, has been prolonged from nine to twenty-seven years. The ancient provincial restraints upon the transportation of corn from one province of the kingdom to another have been entirely taken away, and the liberty of exporting it to all foreign countries has been established as the common law of the kingdom in all ordinary cases this sect in their works which are very numerous and which treat not only of what is properly called political economy or of the nature and causes or the wealth of nations but of every other branch of the system of civil government all follow implicitly and without any sensible variation the doctrine of mr kesney there is upon this account little variety in the greater part of their works the most distinct and best connected account of this doctrine is to be found in a little book written by mr messier de la riviere some time attendant of martinico entitled the natural and essential order of political societies the admiration of this whole sect for their master who was himself a man of the greatest modesty and simplicity is not inferior to that of any of the ancient philosophers for the founders of their respective systems there have been since the world began says a very diligent and respectable author the marquis de mirabeau three great inventions which have principally given stability to political societies independent of many other inventions which have enriched and adorned them the first is the invention of writing which alone gives human nature the power of transmitting without alteration its laws its contracts its annals and its discoveries the second is the invention of money which binds together all the relations between civilized societies. The third is the economical table, the result of the other two, which completes them both by perfecting their object, the great discovery of our age, but of which our posterity will reap the benefit. As the political economy of the nations of modern Europe has been more favorable to manufactures and foreign trade, the industry of the towns, than to agriculture, the industry of the country, so that of other nations has followed a different plan, and has been more favorable to agriculture than to manufactures and foreign trade. The policy of China favors agriculture more than all other employments. In China, the condition of a laborer is said to be as much superior to that of an artificer, as in most parts of Europe that of an artificer is to that of a laborer. In China, the great ambition of every man is to get possession of a little bit of land, either in property or in lease and leases are there said to be granted upon very moderate terms and to be sufficiently secured to the lessees the chinese have little respect for foreign trade your beggarly commerce was the language in which the mandarins of pekin used to talk to mr delange the russian envoy concerning it except with japan the chinese carry on themselves and in their own bottoms little or no foreign trade 
and it is only into one or two ports of their kingdom that they even admit the ships of foreign nations foreign trade therefore is in china every way confined within a much narrower circle than that to which it would naturally extend itself if more freedom was allowed to it either in their own ships or in those of foreign nations manufactures as in a small bulk they frequently contain a great value and can upon that account be transported at less expense from one country to another than most parts of rude produce are in almost all countries the principal support of foreign trade in countries besides less extensive and less favorably circumstanced for inferior commerce than china they generally require the support of foreign trade without an extensive foreign market they could not well flourish either in countries so moderately extensive as to afford but a narrow home market or in countries where the communication between one province and another was so difficult as to render it impossible for the goods of any particular place to enjoy the whole of that home market which the country could afford the perfection of manufacturing industry it must be remembered depends altogether upon the division of labor and the degree to which the division of labor can be introduced into any manufacture is necessarily regulated it has already been shown by the extent of the market but the great extent of the empire of china the vast multitude of its inhabitants the variety of climate and consequently of productions in its different provinces and the easy communication by means of water carriage between the greater part of them render the home market of that country of so great extent as to be alone sufficient to support very great manufactures and to admit of very considerable subdivisions of labor the home market of china is perhaps in extent not much inferior to the market of all the different countries of europe put together a more extensive foreign trade however which to this great home market added the foreign market of all the rest of the world especially if any considerable part of this trade was carried on in chinese ships could scarce fail to increase very much the manufactures of china and to improve very much the productive powers of its manufacturing industry by a more extensive navigation the chinese would naturally learn the art of using and constructing themselves all the different machines made use of in other countries as well as the other improvements of art and industry which are practised in all the different parts of the world upon their present plan they have little opportunity of improving themselves by the example of any other nation except that of the japanese the policy of ancient egypt too and that of the gintu government of Hindustan, seem to have favoured agriculture more than all other employments both in ancient egypt and Hindustan, the whole body of the people was divided into different castes or tribes each of which was confined from father to son to a particular employment or class of employments the son of a priest was necessarily a priest the son of a soldier a soldier the son of a labourer a labourer the son of a weaver a weaver the son of a tailor a tailor etc in both countries the caste of the priests holds the highest rank and that of the soldiers the next and in both countries the caste of the farmers and labourers was superior to the castes of merchants and manufacturers the government of both countries was particularly attentive to the interest of agriculture the works constructed by the ancient sovereigns of egypt for the proper distribution of the waters of the nile were famous in antiquity and the ruined remains of some of them are still the admiration of travellers those of the same kind which were constructed by the ancient sovereigns of Hindustan for the proper distribution of the waters of the ganges as well as many other rivers though they have been less celebrated seem to have been equally great both countries accordingly though subject occasionally to dearths have been famous for their great fertility though both were extremely populous yet in years of moderate plenty they were both able to export great quantities of grain to their neighbours the ancient egyptians had a superstitious aversion to the sea and as the gintu religion does not permit its followers to light a fire nor consequently to dress any victuals upon the water it in effect prohibits them from all distant sea voyages both the egyptians and indians must have depended almost altogether upon the navigation of other nations for the exportation of their surplus produce and this dependency as it must have confined the market so it must have discouraged the increase of this surplus produce it must have discouraged too the increase of the manufactured produce more than that of the rude produce 
manufactures require a much more extensive market than the most important parts of the rude produce of the land. A single shoemaker will make more than three hundred pairs of shoes in the year, and his own family will not, perhaps, wear out six pairs. Unless, therefore, he has the custom of at least fifty such families as his own, he cannot dispose of the whole product of his own labor. The most numerous class of artificers will seldom, in a large country, make more than one in fifty or one in a one hundred of the whole number of families contained in it. But in such large countries, as France and England, the number of people employed in agriculture has, by some authors, been computed at a half, by others at a third, and by no author that I know of, at less than a fifth of the whole inhabitants of the country. But as the produce of the agriculture of both France and England is, the far greater part of it, consumed at home, each person employed in it must, according to these computations, require little more than the custom of one, two, or at most of four such families as his own, in order to dispose of the whole produce of his own labor. Agriculture, therefore, can support itself under the discouragement of a confined market much better than manufacturers. In both ancient Egypt and Indostan, indeed, the confinement of the foreign market was in some measure compensated by the conveniency of many inland navigations, which opened, in the most advantageous manner, the whole extent of the home market to every part of the produce of every different district of those countries. The great extent of Indostan, too, rendered the home market of that country very great and sufficient to support a great variety of manufactures. But the small extent of ancient Egypt, which was never equal to England, must at all times have rendered the home market of that country too narrow for supporting any great variety of manufactures. Bengal, accordingly, the province of Indostan, which commonly exports the greatest quantity of rice, has always been more remarkable for the exportation of a great variety of manufactures than for that of its grain. Ancient Egypt, on the contrary, though it exported some manufactures, fine linen in particular, as well as some other goods, was always most distinguished for its great exportation of grain. It was long the granary of the Roman Empire. The sovereigns of China, of ancient Egypt, and of the different kingdoms into which Indostan has at different times been divided, have always derived the whole, or by far the most considerable part of their revenue, from some sort of land tax or land rent. This land tax or land rent, like the tithe in Europe, consisted in a certain proportion, a fifth, it is said, of the produce of the land, which was either delivered in kind, or paid in money, according to a certain valuation, and which, therefore, varied from year to year, according to all the variations of the produce. It was natural, therefore, that the sovereigns of those countries should be particularly attentive to the interest of agriculture upon the prosperity or declension of which immediately depended the yearly increase or diminution of their own revenue the policy of the ancient republics of greece and that of rome though it honoured agriculture more than manufactures or foreign trade yet seems rather to have discouraged the latter employments than to have given any direct or intentional encouragement to the former in several of the ancient states of greece foreign trade was prohibited altogether and in several others the employments of artificers and manufacturers were considered as hurtful to the strength and agility of the human body as rendering it incapable of those habits which their military and gymnastic exercises endeavoured to form in it and as thereby disqualifying it more or less for undergoing the fatigues and encountering the dangers of war such occupations were considered as fit only for slaves and the free citizens of the states were prohibited from exercising them even in those states where no such prohibition took place as in rome and athens the great body of the people were in effect excluded from all the trades which are now commonly exercised by the lower sort of the inhabitants of towns such trades were at athens and rome all occupied by the slaves of the rich who exercised them for the benefit of their masters whose wealth power and protection made it almost impossible for a poor freeman to find a market for his work when it came into competition with that of the slaves of the rich slaves however are very seldom inventive and all the most important improvements either in machinery or in the arrangement and distribution of work which facilitate and abridge labour have been the discoveries of free men 
should a slave propose any improvement of this kind his master would be very apt to consider the proposal as the suggestion of laziness and of a desire to save his own labor at the master's expense the poor slave instead of reward would probably meet with much abuse perhaps with some punishment in the manufactures carried on by slaves therefore more labor must generally have been employed to execute the same quantity of work than in those carried on by freemen the work of the farmer must upon that account generally have been dearer than that of the latter the hungarian mines it is remarked by mr montesquieu though not richer have always been wrought with less expense and therefore with more profit than the turkish mines in their neighborhood the turkish mines are wrought by slaves and the arms of those slaves are the only machines which the turks have ever thought of employing the hungarian mines are wrought by freemen who employ a great deal of machinery by which they facilitate and abridge their own labor from the very little that is known about the price of manufactures in the times of the greeks and romans it would appear that those of the finer sort were excessively dear silk sold for its weight in gold it was not indeed in those times a european manufacture and as it was all brought from the east indies the distance of the carriage may in some measure account for the greatness of the price the price however which a lady it is said would sometimes pay for a piece of very fine linen seems to have been equally extravagant and as linen was always either a european or at farthest an egyptian manufacture this high price can be accounted for only by the great expense of the labor which must have been employed about it and the expense of this labor again could arise from nothing but the awkwardness of the machinery which is made use of the price of fine woolens too though not quite so extravagant seems however to have been much above that of the present times some cloths we are told by pliny dyed in a particular manner cost a hundred denarii or three pound six shillings eightpence the pound weight others dyed in another manner cost a thousand denarii the pound weight or thirty three pounds six shillings eightpence the roman pound it must be remembered contained only twelve of our avoirdupois ounces this high price indeed seems to have been principally owing to the dye but had not the cloths themselves been much dearer than any which are made in the present times so very expensive a dye would not probably have been bestowed upon them the disproportion would have been too great between the value of the accessory and that of the principal the price mentioned by the same author of some triclinaria a sort of woollen pillows or cushions made use of to lean upon as they reclined upon their couches at table passes all credibility some of them being said to have cost more than thirty thousand pounds others more than three hundred thousand pounds this high price too is not said to have arisen from the dye in the dress of the people of fashion of both sexes there seems to have been much less variety it is observed by mr arbuthnot in ancient than in modern times and the very little variety which we find in that of the ancient statues confirms his observation he infers from this that their dress must upon the whole have been cheaper than ours but the conclusion does not seem to follow when the expense of fashionable dress is very great the variety must be very small but when by the improvements in the productive powers of manufacturing art and industry the expense of any one dress comes to be very moderate the variety will naturally be very great the rich not being able to distinguish themselves by the expense of any one dress will naturally endeavor to do so by the multitude and variety of their dresses the greatest and most important branch of the commerce of every nation it has already been observed is that which is carried on between the inhabitants of the town and those of the country the inhabitants of the town draw from the country the rude produce which constitutes both the materials of their work and the fund of their subsistence and they pay for this rude produce by sending back to the country a certain portion of it manufactured and prepared for immediate use the trade which is carried on between these two different sets of people consists ultimately in a certain quantity of rude produce exchanged for a certain quantity of manufactured produce the dearer the latter therefore the cheaper the former and whatever tends in any country to raise the price of manufactured produce tends to lower that of the rude produce of the land and thereby to discourage agriculture 
the smaller the quantity of manufactured produce which any given quantity of rude produce or what comes to the same thing which the price of any given quantity of rude produce is capable of purchasing the smaller the exchangeable value of that given quantity of rude produce the smaller the encouragement which either the landlord has to increase its quantity by improving or the farmer by cultivating the land whatever besides tends to diminish in any country the number of artificers and manufacturers tends to diminish the home market the most important of all markets for the rude produce of the land and thereby still further to discourage agriculture those systems therefore which preferring agriculture to all other employments in order to promote it impose restraints upon manufactures in foreign trade act contrary to the very end which they propose and indirectly discourage that very species of industry which they mean to promote they are so far perhaps more inconsistent than even the mercantile system that system by encouraging manufactures in foreign trade more than agriculture turns a certain portion of the capital of the society from supporting a more advantageous to support a less advantageous species of industry but still it really and in the end encourages that species of industry which it means to promote those agricultural systems on the contrary really and in the end discourage their own favorite species of industry it is thus that every system which endeavors either by extraordinary encouragements to draw towards a particular species of industry a greater share of the capital of the society than what would naturally go to it or by extraordinary restraints to force from a particular species of industry some share of the capital which would otherwise be employed in it is in reality subversive to the great purpose which it means to promote it retards instead of accelerating the progress of the society towards real wealth and greatness and diminishes instead of increasing the real value of the annual produce of its land and labor all systems either of preference or of restraint therefore being thus completely taken away the obvious and simple system of natural liberty establishes itself of its own accord every man as long as he does not violate the laws of justice is left perfectly free to pursue his own interest his own way and to bring both his industry and capital into competition with those of any other man or order of men the sovereign is completely discharged from a duty in the attempting to perform which he must always be exposed to innumerable delusions and for the proper performance of which no human wisdom or knowledge could ever be sufficient the duty of superintending the industry of private people and of directing it towards the employments most suitable to the interests of the society according to the system of natural liberty the sovereign has only three duties to attend to three duties of great importance indeed but plain and intelligible to common understandings first the duty of protecting the society from the violence and invasion of other independent societies secondly the duty of protecting as far as possible every member of the society from the injustice or oppression of every other member of it or the duty of establishing an exact administration of justice and thirdly the duty of erecting and maintaining certain public works and certain public institutions which it can never be for the interest of any individual or small number of individuals to erect and maintain because the profit could never repay the expense to any individual or small number of individuals though it may frequently do much more than repay it to a great society the proper performance of those several duties of the sovereign necessarily supposes a certain expense and this expense again necessarily requires a certain revenue to support it in the following book therefore i shall endeavour to explain first what are the necessary expenses of the sovereign or commonwealth and which of those expenses ought to be defrayed by the general contribution of the whole society and which of them by that of some particular part only or of some particular members of the society secondly what are the different methods in which the whole society may be made to contribute towards defraying the expenses incumbent on the whole society and what are the principal advantages and inconveniencies of each of those methods and thirdly what are the reasons and causes which have induced almost all modern governments to mortgage some part of this revenue or to contract debts and what have been the effects of those debts upon the real wealth the annual produce of the land and labor of the society the following book therefore will naturally be divided into three chapters
End of Book 4, Chapter 9, Part B End of Book 4